Hey everyone! Today I'll show you how to build a web server in MicroPython using one of these YPy 3.0 boards. And for an example, I have it set up to change the color of the onboard LED using my phone. But it would also work from any device with a web browser. You see, if I click the background of the page, it brings up a color selection dialog, and then the LED will change to whatever color I pick. You can even go in and get really specific with the exact color values. This works because both of these devices are connected to my local Wi-Fi network, but you can also put the Wi-Fi board in access point mode and then connect your phone directly to the board. That way, it doesn't rely on an external network and it'll work anywhere as long as your phone is within range of the Wi-Fi board. So let's hop over to the Python code and see what the server looks like. Okay, so this is what the code looks like, but first I'll show you that I'm connected to the YPy over FTP, so I have access to all the files on it. And this boot.py script is what runs, obviously, when the board boots, and then this main.py is where you put your program, which will run after the boot script is done. So we'll be putting everything in this main.py file. And the first thing I'm doing is importing this PyCom module. And this is so we have access to the API for the LED. And we need the socket module because we'll be writing network code. Next, we turn off the heartbeat from the PyCom API. So by default, the YPy board will blink the LED blue on and off as like a heartbeat, like a status indicator. And we want to turn that off so we can have control over the LED. Next, I'm defining this HTML variable to be just a binary blob of the HTML for our web page. So this is what's going to be returned to the browser when the user goes to the IP address for our device. Uh, it's pretty basic. This line is just to adjust the scale for mobile devices. Then we set the title, um, a little bit of CSS to essentially remove all the padding and border and maximize the width and height of the element because we're using a color element down here that we want to fill the entire background of the page. So that's what this CSS does. And then here is that actual color element itself. Obviously, it's an input of type color, and I've given it the ID of color as well so we can access it from the JavaScript portion of the code and its default value will be black. So if you're familiar with HTML colors, you always have this hashtag, and then two hex values for the red channel, and then two for the green, and then two for the blue, and with all of them zero, we have black. Now, the JavaScript portion is pretty simple. As soon as the page is done loading, we're gonna grab that color element using get element by ID, and we'll store that in this el variable. And then we'll set an event handler. So when the value of the color changes, we'll evaluate this function. And all this function does is it makes an HTTP request to a path that is slash, and then whatever the value of the color element is, except for the first character. And I'm skipping the first character with this slice method because the first character is the hashtag and I don't need it for the URL. So when we change the color, the server is going to get an HTTP get request that will have the hex color as the path or the resource that they're requesting. And that's how our server will know what color they've changed in the browser to update the LED. So hopefully that makes sense. And then down here, we're creating a socket object and we're binding it to port 80 because that's the HTTP port. And then we're starting the listener. This way we can accept incoming requests. The rest of the code is contained in this while loop and the condition is true, so this is gonna run forever. 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 And each time around the loop, we basically just wait for a request so we're waiting for an incoming connection using this accept method of the socket. Once that happens, we'll have access to this connection object. Now I'm putting all of this inside of a try block 
because if any errors happen, I want to catch them here so that we can send an internal server error down here. The main reason for this is that otherwise any errors that happened here, and there are a couple of points where an error could happen, it would raise an exception that would basically crash the server. And obviously that's no good, so we're just going to catch any generic exceptions and return this generic internal server error message. And then after all of that happens, we just close the connection. Now, here's where the actual request handler happens. So we have this connection object, and we're reading one kilobyte from it, which is plenty for what we're doing here. We're assigning that to this request variable, and then splitting that request data by these new lines. Now, if you're familiar with the HTTP protocol, you'll know that the header of HTTP requests, every single line ends with this return character and then a new line character. So now we have a list of every line in the request header. And of course, the first line in any HTTP request is going to contain the HTTP method, the URI that's being accessed, and then the HTTP version. We don't care about the method and version here, just the URI. So now that we have the URI, we can respond in different ways to different resources that they're asking for. The first resource will be this empty path. So this will be the root of the web server. If they visit our server without any path, like if they just go to the IP address in their browser, this is what's going to happen. And all we'll do in this case is send a basic HTTP success status header to say that, hey, everything's fine. And then we just send out that binary blob of the HTML content. So that's it. If they go to the root of the server, we just send the page and tell them that everything was OK. That's pretty simple. The next URI is this favicon.ico. So typically when a web browser loads a page, it checks to see if there's a favicon.ico file. And this is the icon that shows up in the browser's tab. Now, I'm not using a favicon in this demo, so what I'm going to do is return a 404 error, which of course means that the resource wasn't found. This way the browser knows that it's OK, I just don't have a favicon. You could actually return the binary data of an image here if you wanted to have a favicon on your page. All other requests are going to be interpreted as a potential color request. So here's where it's most likely to have an error. But basically what we're doing is we're grabbing the red, green, blue values from the URI. Uh, we're skipping the first value because it's going to be a slash and we don't need that to interpret the color. So once we have the hex values for the color, we know that the red channel is going to be the first two, the green channel is going to be the middle two, and then the blue channel is going to be the right two. And each one of those is going to be parsed using this int function and passing in 16 to say that we want this to be a base 16 integer, which is going to be a hex value. So this will parse the hex value for us and convert it to an integer. So now we have the integer values for red, green, and blue. And we can use those red, green, and blue values to update that PyCom red, green, blue LED. And to do that, you basically just need to call this function with an integer where the three bytes in the integer represent your color channels. So to do that, I'm shifting the red value over by 16 bits. So it's going to be shifted over two bytes. I'm shifting the green value over 8 bits, so it's going to be shifted over 1 byte, and then the blue value is exactly where it should be in the least significant portion of the integer. So after this line, the red, green, blue LED should update. And here is exactly where an error might happen. If someone visits a path on our server that can't be converted into hex, and this int conversion fails, it's going to raise an exception, and that's why we need to catch these exceptions. Otherwise, someone could crash our server just by visiting it with a bogus address, and that's no good. So anyway, after we've updated the LED to turn it to whatever color we want, we'll just send this status OK to tell the browser that everything was fine. This just stops the JavaScript code from returning an error when it does that fetch, right? Like if we go back up to here, if our response didn't return OK, then this fetch would be an error, and we don't want that. And then the remaining lines are, again, to return the internal server error response and close the connection regardless of what happens here. And that's it.
a Python web server running on this tiny little YPy board. Another interesting feature of this setup is that since you can change the color by making HTTP requests, it would be easy to write a script for another device to change the color too. So it doesn't have to be a human user interface, it can be an API for other devices to use, maybe as a status indicator or something like that. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video, and until next time, bye!